Well, you're most welcome to join me today here at Bolt Head. We're actually on Bolt Head, looking back towards Solcombe, and this was the, uh, close by was uh, the former RAF Bolt Head, and uh, the film today is really, uh, it's really all about the Supermarine Wars, which was here principally with 276 Squadron, and used to operate from up on the hill here, and also out in the bay, they were, um, they would often land out here in the bay and uh, meet up with the, uh, uh, with the air sea rescue launches, which were based in, uh, back, back there in Salkham Harbour. So quite a lot went on here, uh, quite a lot of activity, because when the aircraft were taking off, they were coming over here, heading in an easterly direction and off to, uh, off to have a go at the, uh, all the problems in Northern France. So they took off from here. They've got about a hundred miles, uh, miles across sea. Of course, on a return, they're often low on fuel. Uh, they might have some engine problems. So they would very often have to ditch in the, uh, in the sea. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, it, I think it's quite an interesting film coming up, and um, it's principally about the Supermarine Walrus. Uh, of course, it started life with the Royal Navy, and the Air Sea Rescue Service had to uh, had to prise the aircraft away from the Royal Navy to uh, use them in uh, air sea rescue, uh, very often from uh, coastal aerodromes like this one here at uh, Bolt Head. Um, anyway, sit tight. Enjoy the film and uh, let me know what you think in the comments. And uh, have a subscribe. All the support is very much appreciated. All the best. Now we've moved up on top of the hill. Uh, we're just taking a look around uh, Solcombe Town there in the far distance. And uh, in a short while, we'll swing around and have a look at, the, uh, at where the uh, wartime runways were laid out. Um, it's quite interesting to see it from this perspective because uh, you can really appreciate how close to the cliff the uh, the whole uh, aerodrome was and how the uh, pilots when they took off as you can see here we're looking down the old uh, wartime runway towards the cliff edge and that was the main wartime runway and as we swing around we can see just below us the uh, the existing grass runway which is used by small light aircraft and uh, the track that's running just beyond the uh, grass strip is um, is where the wartime runway was. And this track was actually laid on the edge of the uh, wartime runway. And uh, just taking off now is a little uh, light aircraft. And uh, as you'll see him head off in an easterly direction towards the cliff edge, he is following almost an identical line that the uh, wartime aircraft taking off would have followed and uh, as they reached the uh, edge of the cliffs, sometimes they were so heavy that they just crept towards the cliff edge and then had to drop down to sea level to gain speed before they could climb away. Um, so fairly, um, fairly hairy uh, departures from here on uh, many occasion. Now we're just looking down. This is the uh, turning right here. That's the car park at the end there. That is the intersection for the two wartime runways. So one ran east-west and one ran directly north-east-south-west. Day after day, the attack on German-occupied France goes on. Our aircraft swoop down to bomb the German air bases. They pass over German units on the move and shoot them up with machine guns. Attack must mean casualties. But our pilots now know that if they have to bail out over the channel, the new Air Sea Rescue Service is standing by to save them. High-speed launches in the harbors, reconnaissance aircraft in the coastal aerodromes. The efficiency of this service depends upon the watch kept in coastal areas by the observer corps, the army sentries, the gun crews, and the coast guards. Even civilians out for a walk along the cliffs can help by their constant vigilance. Above all, speed is vital. Naval three, please. 
Do this up, up, sir. One. Parachute, 180, Folkestone, 8 miles. Right. Stand by operations room, please. Stand by operations room. Judy Crash officer speaking. HSL 122, 146, Mesby 24, 180, Folkestone, 8 miles. Parachute reported. Operations room calling. Operations room calling. Catapults have been in use since early days, when they were used for hurling stones at battlements. In about 1909, Wright's earlier flights were made from a form of land catapult. It was in 1911 that the possibilities of the catapult for launching aircraft from a restricted space in a battleship or cruiser were considered. This was by the United States Naval Authorities. During the years 1911 to 14, they developed three designs of catapult in the form of a ram operated by compressed air. Experiments were carried out by launching aircraft from a barge. Catapults were then installed in warships, but were insufficiently developed for use at sea during the war of 1914 to 18. In 1916, this country took steps to develop catapults, but it was not until 1922 that any great advance was made by either country. There are now several types of catapult installed in most cruisers and battleships, built or building in our Navy, each new type being an improvement on the last. Catapults are operated by a system of wires and pulleys in conjunction with a ram operated by compressed air or cordite. Since 1928, cordite only has been used, the charge being inserted in a bridge at the end of the cylinder in which the ram operates. The aircraft is launched from a carriage known as the catapult trolley superstructure. It is supported by four catapult spools and the carriage is driven along the catapult track at a maximum acceleration of two and three quarter g. Here we see a light shot fired by a light charge which is employed to test the mechanism without an aircraft. Two additional folded aircraft. In earlier deck types, the aircraft in the hangars are stowed on loading bogies which are traversed by power to transfer the aircraft from the bogey to the catapult trolley superstructure. It should be noted that the loading bogey is fitted with amphibian loading gear legs and rigid nose trimming gear which is being introduced to simplify the loading operation in rough weather. The rigid nose trimming gear can be transferred for loading aircraft direct to the catapult. It replaces an older type of flexible nose chain. In later deck types which have been designed for the King George V and Fiji class ships, the aircraft in the two hangars 
are stowed on the catapult trolley superstructure from which they are launched. The trolley can be transferred to the catapult track at a turntable where it is attached to the catapult wires for the launch. This shows the method of attachment in a cruiser with a D4H type catapult. Standardized aircraft spaces in each... Yes, I see. Hello. Coast Guard says he's lost sight of that dinghy. It's drifted out to sea. Right, I'll get on to the driver car and see if they've got a line on it. Yes, we can just see him from here. 198 degrees Folkestone, 7 miles. 198 degrees Folkestone, 7 miles. Right. would now be armed by aircraft ratings. Each bomb is supplied by a gunner's or supply party using a special bomb loading stretcher. The bomb is then raised to the rack by a loading winch and is engaged in the rack by the armorer. The aircraft should by now have been manned by the crew and a fitter with the handle ready to start the engine when required. We will now demonstrate the operation of launching and recovering aircraft from the stowed position on a loading bogey in the catapult training and experimental ship HMS Pegasus, which is fitted with a D1H type catapult. It must be imagined that the loading bogey is stowed in a hangar, as it would be in the Southampton and Cumberland class cruisers, fitted with this type of catapult. Before launching the aircraft, the seaplane launching party, which consists of the catapult's crew, Bogie's crew and aircraft ratings is closed up and dispersed to their stations. Aircraft ratings are stationed with lines rove ready to spread the wings as soon as the aircraft is clear of the hangar. The pilot verifies that all loose gear in the aircraft has been secured. The directing officer now directs the aircraft to be loaded on and the catapult officer orders the control worker or rating detailed to traverse the bogey clear of the hangar. At the same time, the aircraft is trimmed on the bogey to the loading trim by the leading rating of the bogey's crew, while the jack workers pump up the jacks. The directing officer orders the aircraft ratings to spread the wings. During these preliminaries, the ERA, number one of the catapult's crew, has been preparing the catapult. He sees maneuvering lever central and puts power on the pump. He sees the track and ropes are clear. Extension locking bolts and trolley securing pin are put to out. He sees that extensions are clear for extending and ram for moving. Superstructure earlier legs are topped up. Liquid level in the catapult receivers is checked. Crosshead detents are engaged for the direction of launch. The catapult officer receives reports. The pump is started, after which the control worker is not to leave the control position. The control worker extends the catapult. These extensions are not fitted in battleships which have sufficient beam for a fixed track. The trolley is traversed to the firing position to enable the firing gear to be tested. Meanwhile, the directing officer verifies from the pilot that the aircraft weight is between the maximum and minimum permissible for catapulting, taking care that the estimated catapult speed does not exceed the maximum launching speed of the catapult, as laid down in the drill. He has also to ensure, in collaboration with the captain, that the aircraft is launched within the limiting wind conditions. 
The bridge worker has provided the necessary catapult charge with one spare charge and shown them to the directing officer, who ensures that they are the correct zone charge for the weight of aircraft to be launched. He now tests the firing mechanism before the first launch. He closes the bridge and tests the striker. He recocks and reports to the control worker. The control worker puts over his launching lever. The bridge worker reports if the lock has fired correctly. The control worker returns his lever to the ready position and reports that the firing mechanism is correct. The catapult officer now directs the trolley to be traversed to its loading stop when it is locked in position by another stop. turned 90 degrees to face the loading bogey. The bogey is traversed so that the aircraft front pulls into the jaws of the trolley superstructure and the front jaw locking bolts are returned to the up position. This completes the loading operation. He then tells the pilot that he may run up his engine to test it. While the engine is running up, he checks the directing officer waits at pause drops his flag. The control worker puts over his launching lever smartly and away she goes. He drops slightly. It's a cross wind. If the ship were rolling, the launch would be started on an upward roll. The launching lever has been held over until the launch is complete. We will now show the operation of recovering the aircraft to include the full equipment of steadying gear recommended for rough weather conditions. The captain decides that the aircraft will be hoisted on the starboard side and the ship's course is set with the wind about 60 degrees on the starboard bow. The aircraft is informed by signal that the ship will damp down the rough water in its wake by making what is known as a slick. The aeroplane flag with flag B inferior is hoisted at the dip at the starboard yard arm. Meanwhile, the starboard lower boom has been rigged for recovery by the towed method. The seaplane recovery party close up. This party consists of the catapult's crew, the bogey's crew, and aircraft ratings, as in the seaplane launching party. And in addition, a handling party detailed from the watch on deck. Under rough conditions, it will be necessary for the handling party to consist of about seven or ten ratings detailed from those most likely to be available under action conditions. The directing officer sees that the torpedo party carry out a test deck mating of the Thomas Grab to ensure that the wave compensator barrel is functioning correctly. He then ensures that the quick release coupling is set correctly with the pin in. The particular ratings detailed from the aircraft and handling parties man two bearing out spars and provide the necessary steadying lines and steadying takeoffs. Steadying lines are made up of one and a half inch sisal, or in rough weather, a stronger set of two inch rope. Three lines are hooked on by the special hooks provided to a ring seized to the strop of the quick release coupling. A hand detailed from the handling party reeves the tricing line of the five inch grass recovery hoser through a block at the crane jib head. If the boom is far ahead of the crane, it may be necessary to reeve two of these tricing lines to keep the horser clear of the water. The pilot stops his engine and the hooker on replaces the pin. He then unhooks the three steadying lines and passes them to the pilot and observer who hook them onto the aircraft handling lines. At a sign from the directing officer, the pilot in the cockpit slips the tow from a release in the bow of the aircraft. As soon as the aircraft is under control, of the wing tip steadying lines, the hoisting is continued. The aircraft should be steadied with the nose towards the crane. The 
handling party take rendering turns over cleats in appropriate positions. They must keep the aircraft steady, nose to crane. If necessary, the second tail handling line may now be released by the pilot for further steadying. As soon as the aircraft is over the deck, the crew release two wire martingales from which a steadying tackle is buzzed down to a jack stay, led across the deck to the loading on position. The crane is trained and the friction on the shackle gives considerable steadying effect. Aircraft ratings release and extend the aircraft retractable spool fitting and fit stirrup links onto them. Detailed ratings of the handling party hook takers onto the stirrup links to take over control of the aircraft. The takel under the hull may now be unhooked and the loading legs erected for loading aircraft. If amphibian loading gear was not in use, the catapult trolley would be traversed into the loading on position at this juncture. The aircraft's pulls can be finally guided into the loading legs by hauling down on the positioning takels, the pennants of which are passed over hooks on the stirrup links. The nose trimming gear is attached as soon as the spools are steadied in the loading legs. The directing officer lowers purchase at creep speed until the legs have the weight of the aircraft. test over, she comes out of the water like a duck and waddles up the slipway. Well, it's been really interesting to see all this, uh, all the action from the Walrus aircraft. And as you spotted a bit earlier on, the uh, Supermarine Sea Otter crept in, which was a later, uh, later version. And uh, you'll also notice... Uh, we experience a rather not a very happy ditching of an aircraft which is the sort of thing that uh, these pilots had to contend with when they were trying to land on the water okay take care cheers well, thank you very much for watching it's great if you've uh, stuck with me this long it's been uh, quite a journey i've enjoyed putting this compilation together and i hope you've enjoyed it too please uh, take the greatest of care have a think about subscribing and I look forward to seeing you on the next film. And uh, as I say, it's been a pleasure to have you along. All the very best for now. Cheers. Take care.